Hey everybody, it's Rod Giltaka. Thanks for joining me again. Today we're going to tackle one of the most prolific gun myths out there, and that myth is more guns equal more death. So if you go uh, over to the Coalition for Gun Control's website, you won't see a website there. It's been down for over a month, so I'm not sure what's going on with them. Uh, but their Twitter feed is still alive and well. So let's go over to Twitter and see what the Coalition for Gun Control has to say in relation to this soundbite or this catchphrase that's out there. So on the Coalition for Gun Control's Twitter feed, they got 10, uh, about 10,000 tweets, so they've been pretty busy. The interesting number here is they have 2,200 followers. So you'd think as something as uh, perceived as broadly supported as gun control, that's quite interesting. I have almost uh, half as many followers just for the stuff that I do, which is next to nothing, right? So anyway, point to ponder. Uh, on there, you'll also notice that on February 15th that they use an oldie but a goodie, a sound bite that's gotten so much traction, it's unbelievable, which is more guns equal more death. Sounds pretty convincing, but in caps, no less. But uh, they'll even throw in a qualifier that says, get the facts straight. So get it through your head that this is the truth. More guns equal more death. Now, I personally have heard this myself on the street, uh, in real life, uh, the, the, the same sort of perception. Check it out. In the day, As demonic, that in makes societies sense. where it's easier to obtain firearms and where you're allowed to carry them, there are more, there's just more gun violence. And there are more deaths from gunshots. Regardless of how many statistics you pull out, that's a fact. More people die from firearms in the United States, and it's very easy to obtain firearms in the United States. How, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about how gun control advocates speak in terms of gun control. They always reference the United States. Why? Because the United States have a lot of people. The United States has a lot of guns. And the United States has a fair amount of gun violence. So they always reference the states as by saying, here's what not to do. So in this next clip, it's probably the best six minutes you'll ever invest on the topic of do more guns equal more death. Probably the best. So I encourage you to watch it in its entirety. It's uh, from a fellow named Bill Whittle now. I've, I've looked into Bill, and Bill and I do not agree on all subjects, that's for sure. But I'll tell you, on gun control, I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with Bill Whittle. You know, every time there's a shooting in America, our moral betters on the left immediately ammo up the assault rifle of their rhetorical arsenal, namely, our country's sick, twisted obsession with personal firearms, our adolescent psychosexual, dangerous and frankly embarrassing when facing our European film critic friends, American gun culture. So, hopping over to the ever-reliable Wikipedia, for example, we discovered that when it comes to per capita gun ownership, the USA does in fact top the list in glory. When measured as the number of guns per 100 residents, the US comes in first at 90. 90 guns per 100 residents. Evidence for the progressives on the left that they do in fact live in the murder capital of the world because when it comes to gun ownership, America is number one with a bullet with by far the highest per capita gun ownership in the world. 90 guns per 100 people is half again more than the number two spot held by Serbia with 58. Now, all we have to do to prove the left-wing progressive weenie case for banning guns is to do a quick search for the per capita murder rate. And sure enough, leading the number two country, again, by about half again more, with 90 murders per 100,000 people is Honduras. Socialist gun controlled Honduras. Because even though America has by far the highest per capita gun ownership rate, we do not have the highest per capita murder rate. And unfortunately for the progressive leftist argument, we're not second either. Or third. In fact, when it comes to per capita murders, Team USA didn't even make the top five. As a matter of fact, we didn't even make the top 10. Or the top 20. Or the top 30 or the top 40. We're not in the top 50 per capita murders. Gun culture America is not in the top 60 nations in terms of per capita murders or the top 70 or even the top 80 or the top 90. Of the 218 nations and territories listed for per capita murders, the United States of America, Murderville, USA, did not break the top 100. We are, with 4.7 murders per 100,000 people in 2012, number 111. 111th place puts us near the top of the bottom half 
of all the nations and territories in the world when it comes to total per capita murders, and virtually all, if not all, of those nations ranked higher than us are big state socialist utopias with stringent gun control laws. How tragically disappointing that must be for our moral superiors, and unfortunately for the left, it gets a lot worse because 111th place America's murder rate of 4.7 per 100,000 citizens is artificially much higher than it should be because it includes so many deadly, murderous, toxic places like number one on the list of highly gun controlled, democratically governed since the Stone Age murder pits like Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, with strict gun control laws, has a per capita murder rate of 54.6 murders per 100,000 citizens. If Detroit were its own country, it would just beat Venezuela for second as the most murderous country in the world behind Honduras. America's 111th place, 4.7 murder per 100,000 people, also includes, in order, democratically controlled, heavily gun controlled New Orleans with 53.2 murders per 100,000, St. Louis with 35.5, Baltimore with 34.9, Newark with 34.4, Oakland with 31.8, followed by Stockton, 23.7, Kansas City, 22.6, Philadelphia, 21.5, Cleveland, 21.3, Memphis, 20.2, and Atlanta, 19.0, and of course, Chicago, with 18.5 murders per 100,000 people per year. America's per capita average of 4.7 murders includes all of these high crime areas. The first city to appear in gun mad Texas is Dallas, which isn't even in the top 20. America's overall average of 4.7 is as low as it is because of places like Plano, Texas. It's the last city on the list with a murder rate of 0 0.5. Four. Now, having been to Plano, Texas several times, I can tell you with confidence that virtually every home in Plano, Texas has an entire arsenal of AR-15 assault rifles, semi-automatic shotguns, 30-06 hunting rifles. They got 45s, 357s. They got 38s. They've got 9 millimeters. They have an assortment of 22s for the kids to practice with, not to mention every species of tomahawk, bowie knife, hunting knife, jackknife, bayonet, switchblade. They've got pointy rocks. They've got sharp sticks. The per capita murder rate in Gun Nut Central is 0 0.4 per 100,000. If the United States of America as a nation had the same murder rate as Plano, Texas, we would not be 111 out of 218. We'd be 211 out of 218, well below Switzerland at 0 0.6, half of Germany, Spain, and Denmark at 0 0.8 murders, and well, well below half of New Zealand, the Netherlands, Austria, Italy, France, and Australia. If all of America had the murder rate of the gun nut capital of Gun Culture USA, Plano, Texas, then America's per capita murder rate would be one quarter of those murderous, violent, rampaging, death-worshipping Belgians with their horrific 1.6 murders per 100,000. So maybe it's not the guns. Maybe it's the people holding the guns. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. The day, as demonic that in makes societies sense. where it's easier to obtain firearms and where you're allowed to carry them, there are more, there's just more gun violence. And there are more deaths from gunshots. Regardless of how many statistics you pull out, that's a fact. Now, what's really important is, I'm not trying to make a fool out of this guy. And it's important that you hear this. I have the utmost respect for both of these gentlemen. These guys put themselves out there. They talked to me on camera. They didn't know who I was or what I was going to do with this footage. But they had the guts to tell me what their opinion was. So they get all the respect in the world. The reason I showed this clip again is to illustrate how easy it is to take a factoid or a sound bite or to take some information from the mainstream and internalize it and repeat it as if it's true. So I think that it's, uh, it's really important that we all do our own research. We all go out there and we all, we all got to find the truth because you just won't find it in the mainstream media. You won't find the truth from government sources. You won't find the truth from the Coalition for Gun Control. You've got to go find it for yourself and make your own judgment. So don't believe me. I'm going to put a variety of clips in the description box for you so you can access all this information. Now, how are we gonna bring this back to Canada? Well, it's interesting. Toronto experiences a lot of gun violence. And there is this underculture in Toronto City Council and in a lot of different groups in, in Ontario that think that gun control is the answer to their gun violence problem. Where it really starts taking a left turn 
is when they start, start talking about gun bans. And most people don't agree with them on that because they know that gun bans don't have any effect on criminal behavior or on gangsters. So the CBC did this mini-series called Under the Gun. And despite all the other work that CBC does on gun violence and gun control and all the advocacy that they do, uh, they actually got it right. And I'm not even sure they even knew that they did. So I'm going to show you this next clip from their series, which is Under the Gun. I'm going to show you sort of the middle of what this, this, uh, this area, the suburb of Toronto did to combat their gun violence problem. And then I'm going to show you the beginning at the end so that you can see what the net effect was. It'll be very interesting. In the early 2000s, Banff Ledbury had a reputation for being one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Ottawa. So I came to this country to feel safe. And this is not the safest place to be. A gang called Ledbury Banff Crips, LBC, ruled the streets, selling drugs and intimidating residents who lived here. Police made arrests, but residents were reluctant to testify or even call them when they saw trouble. Staff at the house turned to the community itself to find a solution. I think it was definitely a trust at the beginning. It's just getting to know your community and your community house and that it was more about how can we build relationships so that we can work together to address social issues. The city created a pilot project called No Community Left Behind, bringing together police, health and social workers, community leaders and members of the different ethnic groups. It's now expanded to other social housing communities in the city's south end. Each month, they get together to compare notes. Youth have been very engaged in a plan for this year, and their focus is on healthy, healthy youth, healthy children. It's 3 o'clock, and the homework club is just getting underway. Every day, kids get off their buses and march directly into the Banff Community House. So if you didn't have to look... What would be the next number? As useful as the help is with math, English, sciences, the students are also learning some important life lessons about responsibility, organization, and not falling behind. The homework club is the only place that I could do my homework, and I love it. What would you be doing if you didn't have this? Um, going home, not really finishing my homework, and just, like, uh, Lying to my brother, then I've, I'm done my homework. <laughs> this homework club is one of more than a dozen programs aimed at keeping children in this community busy. There's also jujitsu, swimming, and even tutoring classes. And for both children and parents, it sure beats the alternative. Of the 49 shootings in Ottawa last year, none were in Banff Ledbury. So it does look like 10 years in, the programs there are reaping benefits. So if you see what really happened there, the CBC showed that a correlation really didn't exist in Banff Ledbury between access to firearms and firearm violence. In fact, they showed in that mini documentary that the inverse was true. What we saw were communities coming together to solve the true causes of violent crime. Lack of opportunity, lack of personal empowerment, lack of education. How about alcohol, drugs, the drug trade, poverty, unemployment? These are hard problems to fix. It's a lot easier to pass a collection of laws that bully and criminalize only the people who choose to participate in the system itself, the people who aren't doing the shooting. Guns have been available at the same level over the past 10 years around Banff Ledbury. So what's changed? No, more guns don't equal more deaths. But when you've run out of ways to trick people into believing things that aren't true, what do you have left? Um, and uh, what this shows is that they've been told by the RCMP that allowing these weapons, weapons that our group has been going, you know, from media to media, from hearings to hearings, to show that these guns are currently unrestricted and outside of Quebec, no longer registered. So even the police doesn't even know who's buying these weapons, who they're selling them to. These are legally available, non-restricted long guns that, that, that are completely off the police's uh, radar. And the conservatives are letting this happen. One of these days, somebody might get their hands on these guns and use it in a huge massacre. 
and the conservative government will, will be held accountable because now they can change it. They've known years, they've been told, I mean, I'm sure they've known forever, but now they've been formally told by the RCMP that these are dangerous weapons and they should be prohibited, and yet they've done nothing. And even with this report uh, being shown to them, um, I understand that their answer is that they're not gonna do nothing about it. Considering everything you've seen in this mini documentary, especially the last clip, I think you'd agree that it's far past the time for us to have an open and honest discussion about firearms related violence and gun control in Canada. If we ever really want to solve the problems that we're claiming to want to solve, we got to get together as a team. We have to set aside all our ideologies. We have to look at what works and what doesn't work. And we got to be honest with each other. One of the most important things for us to do in, in attempting to solve these problems is to stop treating gun control as a political issue. Gun control should be a public safety issue, but right now it's not. It's a political football that gets thrown back and forth. Victims uh, on both sides of the argument caught in the middle, and the political class really doesn't care. It's an election issue. It's a hot button topic. We need to stop doing that. And again, as I said, be honest with each other and get together and solve our problems. Anyway, hopefully this information was useful. Um, thank you for taking the time to view this video. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can at CivilAdvantage1 or find us on the net at www.civiladvantage.com. Thanks for watching.